Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from, and a warm welcome to all. You have joined the first technical session for Module 7, Video Production Basics, which will address the basic tools needed to produce videos for your museum. This is the seventh module of the Digital Empowerment Project, a nationwide initiative organized by the six U.S. regional museum associations that is dedicated to providing free self-paced training resources for small museums. This inaugural series of online trainings and resource toolkits focused on digital media and technology topics is made possible by funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. My name is Zinnia Willits and I am the Executive Director of the Southeastern Museums Conference. My pronouns are she, her, I am a light-skinned white female with shoulder-length reddish-brown hair. I'm wearing black-rimmed black glasses that are often referred to as cat-eye style. And today, I'm wearing a black sleeveless sweater and I'm sitting in front of a backdrop of my home office, which consists of a desk and a few computers behind me. As the host for today's session, I would like to convey a few things to our attendees before we begin the program. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute our physical sense of place, it is important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. Today I am speaking to you from Charleston, South Carolina, the historical homelands of the Natchez Cuso peoples. Wherever we are, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders both past and present, as well as future generations. We, the Digital Empowerment Project team, recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society that perpetuated the exclusions and erasures of many Native peoples throughout the United States and beyond. We ask that you reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. And now for just a few housekeeping notes before we introduce today's presenter and get started. First, the best place to view this session in real time is on the Museum Learning Hub website under the Watch Live tab at museum-hub.org. Here you'll be able to see all the captioning, chat, and other questions. I would also like to acknowledge today's American Sign Language interpreter who will be on the left side of your screen and let you know that captioning for today's program will be embedded in a box just below the YouTube player on our website with controls to adjust your experience. The best way to continuously refine our programs is to listen to our attendees and we ask that you share your candid feedback with us. Following today's program, you'll be sent a link to a satisfaction survey. Sharing your experience through this survey will only take a few minutes and will greatly improve our work. We encourage you to pose questions to our presenter which will be addressed at the end of the program after the presentation. Please type your questions in the chat and a digital empowerment team member will be gathering them. We'll address as many questions as time allows. However, we may not be able to get to all the questions and others may arise. For this reason, we have set up an online community forum for raising questions, posting answers, and connecting with your fellow museum practitioners on the Museum Learning Hub website. If you're looking for help between programs, please visit this forum, create a login, and post your questions. A member of the community or one of our student technology fellows will get back to you. Finally, to stay connected, be aware of future programs, please follow us on social media. All of our links will be posted in the chat throughout the program. Now it is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Luke Mahaffey. Luke is the Media Services Coordinator at the North Carolina Museum of Art in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he has been on staff since 2014. He's currently the video producer for the museum and serves as part of the marketing and communications team. As a Raleigh, North Carolina native, the museum has always been a place he's called home. He graduated from East Carolina University with a double concentration in media performance and media production, where he met his wife. Four children later, Luke is still excited to call the North Carolina Museum of Art his home and glad to grow with and contribute to the museum and its offerings. I have enjoyed getting to know Luke and am thankful to all of the time he has devoted to this session. Now I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Luke Mahaffey to begin our session. 
Thank you, Zinnia. I am so excited to be here and just get to share what I've learned um, in the video production world. So um, I did want to start off with a sample of one video we did a couple years ago. And um, it just sort of gives a good broad overview of the North Carolina Museum of Art, of which I get to be a part of every day. Um, I think working on this team here as um, the video producer, it really gives me a broad range of people to get to work with. We have an education department, we have catering staff, we have conservators, we have curators. Um, there's just, a, there's so much that happens here at the museum. And uh, I, I just thought I would start off this presentation with um, a quick video to give you sort of a 90 second summary of, uh, of what we do. And then we'll, we'll dive into the presentation following. So here we go. We are the North Carolina Museum of Art. And we are? Librarians. The marketing team. Nature enthusiasts. Storytellers. Exhibition designers. We are art lovers and caretakers. The special events department. Park poets. Information technology. The registration department. We are writers and editors. Construction supervisors. Art handlers. Gallery educators. Fundraisers accessibility advocates, curators, the financial arm of the institution. We are virtual educators, park staff, conservators, a dining experience, students, volunteers, and we are builders, unique, creative, the face of an institution, here to make the place look good, vibrant, growing and moving, hardworking, resourceful, passionate, cool. We are food and beverage. We are security guards. We are membership. We are housekeepers. We are designers. We are Raleigh's artful shopping destination. We are the stewards of truth. We are the eyes and ears of the museum. We are guardians of the people's collection. We are protectors. We are sustainers. We are cultural ambassadors. We are the North Carolina Museum of Art. So um, this museum, it was uh, started in the 50s, in the 1950s, and we moved into uh, this building that we're in now, that last scene on the video um, in the 1980s. And since then, we've expanded. We've built a whole nother building, um, and we keep growing. We have about a 164-acre campus, and we're kind of right on the west side of Raleigh, North Carolina. So um, we have a great location. Um, there's a, a, just a lot of things to do, a lot of things to see, whether you're coming inside to the museum to see a lot of our special exhibitions or whether you're just enjoying the weather and strolling around the outdoors. We have sculptures. Um, we have programming. We have concerts. We have a movie screen mounted to the outside of our building. So we have a very unique um, position to serve the community and allow the entire state of North Carolina to enjoy not just artwork, but, um, you know, the arts. So I'll keep going in my presentation. And I wanted to talk a little bit about one of our programs that we had uh, just this past summer. We partnered with PBSNC and they brought in an army of people and trucks and vans full of equipment and we did this thing called music at the museum there was probably about seven or eight different musical groups who came in and performed in our gallery in the west building and they sounded great they looked amazing uh, they were very talented musicians um, and it was a neat partnership so pbsnc what they did was film these but we also pushed a live stream across our youtube channel so that during the pandemic, everybody could enjoy music at the museum. And it was, it was an amazing partnership, um, but I wanted to talk about a lot of the technical parts of what we did. Um, as you can see from this photo, there are numerous cameras, there's colored lights all back in the gallery. 
Um, there's tripods and uh, a jib on the front left. Um, there was um, there was a team that worked on audio. There was a network engineer. There were truck drivers. There was a creative director, a technical director, and it was it was kind of a sight to see for me being here at the North Carolina Museum of Art as a one man operation. I don't have a uh, editor. I don't have a camera crew. I don't have a, a lighting tech. I, it's it's me to do a, a lot of what, what we do here. Um, I do get to recruit help for larger shoots, but uh, what my job was for this was to promote each and every show. So each group would come in and they did um, one dress rehearsal. I would film that dress rehearsal and then we would upload that video to YouTube and then people knew it was it was a promotional video so they could come and watch the show or they couldn't come and watch the show they could tune in and watch the live stream the following day so i wanted to just show a quick example of what i shot so you could see um everybody else's equipment and then i thought really it, it would it would give the viewer who's watching this behind the scenes appreciation for everything else that everybody else is doing as I kind of threaded the needle and came through those two camera guys, I don't have any audio playing because um, I wasn't sure if I would have Charlie Smart's permission to share uh, this song. He was he was really good, but um, we wanted to give a you know good experience in about a 45 second range of what the performance was about and just their style. So all of those pieces of equipment. Um, you know, it really does add up. You can um, see all the cables and stands and ladders and everything that's, that's just all over the place. And I said, I don't know that I need all of this. I'm just going to use one camera. I'm going to get my one shot. I didn't even make any cuts. And I tried making that the theme throughout each of the videos. Start really wide, just kind of do a creeping in shot or kind of move around the performers so you could get a feel for the entire space. And I use this camera to do all of those videos. It's a DJI Osmo Pocket and uh, it shoots 4K video. When I looked up to the, the, the price a month or so ago, it was only $150. So I just wanted to reiterate and I will continue to reiterate. You don't need millions and millions of dollars worth of equipment to make something look good and to share what's happening inside your museum with the world. So I, I do want to start off talking about why video. Um, if you're watching this session, then you probably have recognized there is a benefit to video over just still images. Still images are everywhere. And if a picture is really a thousand words, then one second of video can contain up to 60 still images in that one frame just to show the motion. Um, and I think there is an understanding of this in, in most people's uh, amazement of just entertainment world. There's movies, there's TV. Um, having something where you can string along a story, you can understand a character, you can um, really just watch something unfold right before your eyes with video. And that's why that's why I think it's really special. And that's um, been a good tool to see how it resonates in uh, whatever platform we're, we're releasing a video. So um, before you ever hit record on your camera, um, if you're if you're a video person, if, if you're looking to hire a video person, um, if you're in marketing and you want to start creating more video content, you're really in the right place. We're gonna we're gonna cover a whole bunch of stuff, rapid fire, starting right now. Okay, so the first thing is, um, what is the purpose? What do you want this video to to convey? Do you want somebody to like click on something after they finish? Do you want them to feel a certain way? Do you want them to make a donation? Do you want them to just have information? You need to know what the purpose of this video is before you ever hit record. And it's also really important to know the target audience. Um, if it's donors, if it's visitors, if it's your staff, is it a preschool class? You need to know who's going to be watching this video because that's going to help you with the second point, which is what's your story? How are we going to get there? So the first one, 
why are we doing this? What's the goal? Where are we going? And then the second one, how are we going to get there? Um, you can usually use a story or some type of creative avenue to, to get your point across. Um, in the intro video that we just watched, we basically used all of our staff's own voices and we had them in their own words talk to a microphone and we recorded them saying here's what we believe the mic the, the museum is this is what we feel like our role is here i'm not i'm not just a housekeeper but i love to do what i do i love that i get to work in a place like this we are all of these things we are um so the the story really kind of captured itself of these are these th these are our staff's voices telling people what they do um, and then the last thing is what tools do you have just like a chef has a kitchen full of tools a mechanic has a garage full of tools um, if you're doing video you want to know like what what resources do i have to get this job done and i wanted to show you an example Okay, so that was one example of uh, tools we had were uh, mascots who we wanted to come to our museum. And we, we knew that we were gonna promote March Madness basketball season, but we wanted to let these mascots roam around in our museum looking at different uh, artworks that had a ram or a wolf or the color blue. So the story was, let's get them in the museum and they're exploring it and they're discovering it and they're seeing all this stuff uh, for the first time. The resources were, we had people, we had um, partnerships with close by universities who also saw this as, hey, this is a cultural experience for us. And this is a way that we can just go be at the museum. And then the goal really was to just create excitement and to ride the hype wave of March Madness. Um, so other tools that I think we're going to get now deeper into when you look at video production is cameras. Um, that can be anything on this list, uh, all encompassing um, cameras. It can just be a smartphone if that's all you have. But um, we're, we're going to do a little bit deeper dive into types of cameras. Another component to think about when you're looking at video production gear is storage. So media, what are you gonna to record to? Some cameras have an internal storage drive, but most of them you've gotta put a SD card in. Once your SD card fills up with all that data, you've gotta know where it's gonna go after that. Is it gonna get dumped on a computer? Once your computer gets full on video, what are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna back it up to a server? Are you gonna upload it to a cloud? You really need to know, okay, this is one component that, that's, that's gonna um, need to be considered. Another thing is just stability. Um, if you have a tripod or a monopod, something that really just makes your video look smooth and stable and professional, it, it increases the quality of it instead of just, you know, if you have a cell phone and really shaky video, I'm sure we've all seen those. Um, that's, that's just something to consider. Do we want to invest in stability for our videos? The next thing is lights. Um, there's a bunch of different types of lights that you can get. Um, and I would just work with what you have. Uh, if you have work lights and they're in your facilities garage, then, you know, use the work lights that you have. Um, lighting is one of those really underrated components to video and you can make it look dramatic. You can, you can almost tell a story within the lighting po portion of, of a video. Another thing is to consider is power. Um, there's not uh, many things that you would be doing outside with no power at all. But if you are doing something that requires batteries, uh, you just want to make sure you're charging your batteries. If it's camera batteries, um, 
whether it's batteries that you can take portably to run your lights from or to run your gear from, um, you just want to make sure that that's, that's being thought about. And I would say that audio is probably the most important thing to consider in video production, mostly because uh, even, well, I don't, I'm not sure about StreamYard, but Zoom, I think, also will prioritize audio. If there's an interruption in the data or the network gets a blip, it, it will make sure that audio is still coming through, even though the video you know, may have freeze framed. And even you know, back in the olden days when we had telephones and only telephones, you couldn't see anybody's face from a camera. It was just listening in to audio only, and you can get a lot of information across um, with audio. So you, you want to make sure that everything is sounding good. If you're doing an interview or a talking head video, you really want to make sure that there's uh, intelligible audio coming through. And then the last one, I'm sorry, I don't think this is the last one, one more after this. There's post-production things to consider. Uh, do you do you have uh, any kind of video editing that's going to happen? Once you get your audio, once you get your video, all your lighting and everything looks good. It's recorded onto your SD card. You've dumped it onto your computer. Does anything else need to happen to it before you upload it? Did somebody say a curse word in there that you need to edit out? Um, did somebody trip or mess up? Then, okay, well, we need to put it into the editing room. Uh, this can be a full-time person job all in and of itself. So I would encourage you to look into what video editing looks like and can consist of, as, as well as um, We'll, we'll go over some free options at the very end uh, if, you, if you don't have the funds to uh, install and download um, high quality video editing software. So one thing that I've really had to kind of wrap my brain around is the structure of a shoot. If I have a band coming in or if there's a lot of moving parts and I, I know that I can't be everywhere and I can't carry all of my stands and all of my cameras and all of my lights, I got to I got to get some help. So that means there needs to be workflow. I need to train people. I need to make sure everybody who's going to volunteer or help out or get hired as a contractor to come and help with the shoot. I I need to make sure they know what they're doing. Um so that that's an investment as well. And how how are you going to how are you going to do that? So you really can spend a lot of money accessorizing your gear list and that's that's kind of just what some of these things are. Um, the list goes on and on. There's there's more to this, but uh, if if you get into it, um, you know the the list just adds up of things that you might need. So instead of spending a million dollars, you you can kind of get by um, in today's world with technology uh, to to create content um, with without without breaking the bank. So my questions when I was first getting started in the video production world were, well, what camera do I need? What kind of microphones? Well, what, what kind of lights are best? And what I found was if I didn't have somebody telling me, oh, you have to use this brand or, oh, you have to use this lens, I, I just found that YouTube was my friend. Um, I would get online. I would do a search. I would see what other people, what other institutions, just kind of compare um, and see what's working. And I really got interested in seeing someone use a $200,000 cinema camera right alongside, you know, a Apple iPhone 8 or 9, and they would shoot the exact same videos. And you had to pick which one was the $200,000 camera and which one was, was not. So uh, I would just say these three buckets are the big investments that you would want to start off in getting a good camera, whether it's a smartphone or not, getting a good microphone and having something to light uh, whatever it is you're shooting. So types of cameras, uh, we'll just go over these smartphones, as I said, camcorders. That's what we started out with here at the museum. We had one Canon Vixia camcorder. It shot full HD and that's pretty much it, but it was what we had, so that's what we did a lot of stuff with. Cinema cameras, they're meant to have a lot more professional settings, and you can add on batteries or export, you know, uh, 
data via an SDI connection. There's a lot of things that you can do in a cinema camera to tweak the settings. Um, mirrorless cameras, that's that's what we've started using a lot. And these are um, not a DSLR, but um, basically if you look at the lens, the sensor is right inside. And I'm actually gonna try and show you guys this. So if you take the lens off of a mirrorless camera, then you can see the sensor is right inside the camera. Um, and we've gone with Panasonic brand just because we wanted to make sure all of our colors were staying fairly similar. If we got Canon or Nikon or Blackmagic Design, some of those sensors, they look a little bit different um, in the end and the colors can be just a little bit off. So another uh, types of cameras, other types of cameras, action cameras um, like GoPros and, and drones. So microphones, um, as we talked about, this is the most important component, I would say. If you're just using your on-camera microphone, it's, you know, maybe webcam quality. It's not going to sound amazing, but it, it is something. If you're listening to me right now, I'm using a Logitech C920 webcam, and you hopefully can hear me okay. Uh, but lav mics are also another thing that, that are really useful. And if you have a lav mic, um, it, it's meant to get as close to the source as possible. So we, we usually put these right here on the lapel. That way it's picking up everything that's coming through. And we're actually using um, wireless transmission for our audio. So we have the microphone, which the person will wear, and then we have a, um, a receiver which goes right next to the camera. So we can make sure that all the audio comes straight in. Uh, also would invest in a good pair of headphones so you can listen in and make sure what's being recorded sounds as good as you want it to. Um, shotgun microphones are another thing, uh, or if you need voiceover microphones, you can usually get those fairly cheaply. They're um, a USB connection to your computer. You can just have somebody sit at a desk and, and get good, good uh, quality audio. So also, I've seen these. These are um, like a onboard mixer. So I can plug two separate audio sources into this. And then I have level control. So I can dial up one or dial down the other. Um, they're really helpful if you need to get more than just one microphone source into your camera recording. And then lights. Um, those can get really expensive if you wanted to spend money on lights. Um, we're not quite there on lights. We we usually just do whatever's uh, the cheapest and closest. So if you have shop lights, like I said, those, those can work. If you have a way to um, diffuse a light, um, I'll actually show you this right now, the light I have at my desk. I just put a Kleenex over the front of it so it's not quite as bright it's a little bit diffused but um those are those are really ways that i i would encourage anybody if you're if you're doing a shoot if you have to figure out okay well this this is our problem how are we going to get past this um it's always helpful uh to to think in different ways so these are traditional um methods and strategies and things that they'll teach you in school if you if you you know take media production uh, how are you composing your shot which things are you putting on the left side of the frame um, use the rule of thirds which is dividing the screen sort of into three sections um, both horizontally and vertically making sure you white balance your cameras so that the, the camera knows that this color is white and that color is always going to be white you know using three point lighting where you have a main key light on somebody's face you have a, a fill light on the other side, and then you have something from behind that's like a backlight. So there's there's a lot of things um, that I think you can use and that you can learn, but those rules, they don't always apply. So I really would just encourage you uh, to think outside the box. And I think we have a question that I've, I've seen as we're talking about lighting. Um, yeah, lighting, um, 
that you probably wouldn't want to use is uh, fluorescent lighting. Um, they have some called like compact fluorescent lamps or CFLs. Um, those those take a while to heat up. Um, they get they take a long time to really get bright. You usually need a lot of different bulbs. Um, I think I've I've really landed on LEDs just because they can get really bright with using not very much power. Also, they don't get hot. So when you finish a shoot, you don't have to wait an hour for your, your lamp to cool off. Um, if you're using a tungsten or a halogen, uh, then those can get really hot because they really get bright. But um, I, I really do also like using deflect, uh, not deflectors, reflectors. So if you have a sun or a bright light that you can bounce, um, you know, just use a big white board and um, you use that. But like I said, just thinking outside the box, um, if, if it's, uh, you know, shooting through a mirror or a window, um, just just all of the, all the different things. There's there's a lot of ways that you can be creative. So when I first started at the North Carolina Museum of Art, I was mainly shooting um, docent programs and lectures in our auditorium um, with that Canon Vixia camcorder. And, you know, we would do stuff in the galleries and just want to make sure people understood what was happening. And if there was a training session that our docents missed, uh, they, they wanted to have that recorded so they could see what they'd missed. And then one thing that I'll briefly go over is uh, we did a dance off video at the museum and um, it was kind of embarrassing. All of our staff were just dancing around to a cool in the gang song called Celebrate. But once people sort of saw that I liked to do video stuff, I was getting a little bit more involved with exhibitions and um, stuff that was going on our uh, website. So here's me filming a promotional video that we had a couple years ago. It was called Rolling Sculptures. And these were cars from the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it was really kind of interesting because a car wasn't made to just go sit in a gallery. A car was meant to be driven. It was meant to be to move. And we really wanted to show these cars in motion as they were coming off of a truck and getting rolled into the gallery. So with this camera, we also added a couple more. Um, I call them faux pros because they were fake GoPros. I think they were only like 60 or $70 a piece, but they were small enough that we could mount them on a dashboard or on the hood of a car, and there wasn't any danger of them scratching the, the cars. Um, and yeah, we shot a video. So I'm going to let you guys see this. And just having one camera uh, that I could handhold and then a couple of these that we used to do time lapses, I'll show you guys what, what we ended up making. <laughs> Okay, so um, these next few slides, we're going to talk about cell phones in particular. Uh, if you had to shoot something like that using a cell phone, um, it's so much more convenient. Uh, I actually just got a new cell phone personally uh, a few weeks ago. It's a Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus, and it, it was $150. Uh, it'll shoot 4K video. It'll shoot slow motion video. And I haven't used it a whole lot yet, but I'm, I'm hoping to. So if all you have is a cell phone, which most of us do in our pocket, then you can, you can make stuff. Uh, as you can see, this image on the left, um, there's a monitor on the top, a shotgun mic, there's rail system, there's a cage around the camera, a really nice fluid head tripod. Uh, th this person spent a lot of money putting this video camera together. but as I had said, you know, seeing people do side-by-side -side videos on YouTube, examples of, 
hey, here's a really beautiful sunset <laughs> uh, video of it, and I really can't tell the difference. So um, if you put a smartphone in a gimbal, this is one that we bought last year, then we have also been able to do live video conferencing from our galleries. So I'll put this on the top of a monopod and walk around kind of like an extended selfie stick, but it has three motors inside the gimbal that are all sort of self-balancing. And just like this little camera that we used for the um, video at the beginning, music at the museum, I'll, I'll try and hold this close up to the camera. No matter how I move, um, it holds a steady shot. So that's that's basically what a gimbal is. I can turn it, um, I can tilt it up or down. And if if you can throw your cell phone into one of these, then uh, your, your video is gonna look smooth. So here's an example of me walking down a hallway, as holding my new phone as still as I possibly could, and then putting it in the gimbal and walking down the same hallway. There's, there's clear shakiness on the right side and clear smoothness on the left side. So it's just, just you know, one, one small way to make your videos look a little bit more professional. All right, so if you do have a smartphone and you wanna use that, you can modify it, you can accessorize it, you can put a microphone, a light on there, um, you can do whatever else you need to. Okay, some other things I want to talk about in addition to just basic video production. Um, chroma keying, or using a green screen, allows you to separate whatever you've filmed in front of that. I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, all the special effects in Hollywood, all these movies where action movies, you know, they, they, they separate that. Um, but it basically lets you change the color or change the background of whatever is green. For rolling sculpture, you know, we shot our curator in front of a green screen, and then we could put moving public domain archive video of cars driving around behind her. We could use images of the actual cars that were in the show. And it's just one other way to, to you know, make your, your videos uh, a little bit more engaging. So another benefit to video is you can stretch out time or you can speed up time. So this was our movie screen getting uh, re restored. And um, this was a Yoyoi Kusama piece that we have in our West building getting built. Um, it took them a full day, but hey, we just watched it in 10 seconds. <laughs> it's really kind of a neat way for us to get video content um, very quickly into the eyes of interested viewers. So we have a video similar to this playing on a wall in our lobby that shows all of our park art. So if if people who can't walk around our entire 164 acre campus, you know, can't really see those, we wanted to make sure that they had a way to see those if they're here inside. Um, so time lapses is just one of those types of um, benefits that you can get um, if you if you have an outdoor project like this one that took months to build. Uh, you can you can show it to somebody. Hey, this is this is what <laughs> happened in the past uh, few months, but just just take 10, 15 seconds to watch it. So uh, again, I, I I do enjoy watching these um, because you can just sort of set up time lapse cameras, let them capture whatever it is, and then you go in to the editing floor and you just kind of it's like fishing. You see what you see what you got. Um, here's our King Saul getting a conservation treatment. Okay, so the editing and review process, uh, once you record your videos and you need to dump it into a software editor, speaking of time lapses, this is a time lapse of one we did with uh, Alterpiece. There was five different characters on this Alterpiece and we wanted to make a Zoom, like a pretend Zoom room and let them have sort of a discussion between them selves uh even though they're all on the same panel uh and you know this was just sped up video of what it looked like for me to go in and edit that that video so um when you're when you're doing when you have the post-production um benefit there's there's a lot of uh things you can do after the fact so there's a phrase fix it in post 
which means if you do something wrong or if you mess up, oh yeah, we'll just go and we'll we'll fix it later. So um, another program that I used to create this time lapse was a software program called OBS, and it stands for Open Broadcast Software. It basically allowed me to do a screen capture of my computer. Every, every small little change that I did in this in this edit, I was able to capture the whole thing. Uh, open broadcast software will also allow you to use your computer as an encoder, and then you can push that stream to YouTube. You can push that stream to Facebook uh, or or wherever. So when when we do live video production here at the museum, we can use that and type in our stream key. We can get everything sent and and pushed to the platform of our choice, and and then using a really nifty tool. Um, this is called a uh, Black Magic Design ATEM Mini, and it's a four HDMI video switcher. So I can plug in four different HDMI inputs to the back. Usually it's cameras, but it can be a computer. And then I can just, you know, select which button, which camera I want to send to the main screen or to the, to the program. So, for example, in this concert we did with uh, Carolyn Colquitt, and she brought in a cellist from the North Carolina Symphony, and we had Sandra Dubose as our narrator. Um, these might look like still images from the performance, but they are in fact not. They are single cameras that we had set up on the stage right next to, you can actually see, if I can hover my mouse over here, this is the one camera over by the piano that's give, giving me this shot. So this camera over here, if you can sort of see that in front of the cello, it's giving me this shot. And then we had a bunch of other cameras in the back that we used to zoom in. And I plugged in another video switcher into my four input HDMI switcher. So I had seven different cameras. And this is a, a frame grab from each one of those. So I had seven live video feeds. And I could just use my switcher and say, okay, I want this camera, I want this camera. I could do crossfades and sort of tell a story, but it wasn't getting recorded to my computer or to my camera's SD card. It was going straight to YouTube. So we had a live audience here in the house, in the auditorium, but we also had uh, about 100 people watching this concert from the comfort of their own homes. So this is sort of the bonus uh, level. This is the end credit scene where you stayed around and you get some of these free resources. Um, if you ever do decide you want to look into investing in a new phone or you don't have a camera yet, but you have some people who have smartphones, this website I found is, is really good. They're helpful in doing in-depth reviews. What cameras have what specifications? If you wanted to use your camera on your phone professionally or you know you can look at frame rates or all the different settings and they they give a bunch of detailed reviews so these resources will be made available in a spreadsheet or in a list somewhere for you um okay so video editing you really can spend a lot of money uh adobe creative suite i'm not sure how much it costs um but you can you can bypass the cost black black magic design the same company who makes that little four input hdmi switcher they have a free version of it's called davinci resolve and it's a professional video editing software uh, you, you don't have to buy anything you don't have to register that i know of you can just go to their website download it and use it and there's a full range of professional um, uh, tools to use color correction if you need to you know change uh, any anything it's 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 rather amazing that it's uh, free software another free software in case they ever start charging for that one is one called shotcut it's an open source program and it's not it doesn't have as much overhead there's not quite as many advanced features but it is it is free and then here's uh, just a visual to go along with that OBS software that we've used to both record our screens and to push a stream. Another one that I was able to use some images for my presentation today is called pixabay.com. I think that's how you pronounce it, but it allows you to search for 
and download with an account um, all free, open source, public domain, no attribution required, uh, stills, images, vector graphics, and video clips. Another thing you might need in the future if you're scouting out a location for a video shoot this is a, a cell phone app I've downloaded. It's called Sun Locator Light. And if I wanted to see where the sun is going to be at 4 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon in November, I can go to that location, use my app, use my camera, and see where the sun is. It will position the sun. Oh, okay, the sun's going to be behind this building. I might not have a direct light on my subject you know, during this. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's just really helpful if you want to see when the sun sets or comes up. And then this last one is a uh, free music archive. So if you you have some, if you need some backtracks for your videos, you want a really catchy song or audio to go along with it, you can search for those in here. Some of them do require um, attribution to the artist, but there's a lot of free stuff in here. YouTube usually has an audio library as well. If you, excuse me, if you have a YouTube account, you can go into your studio and listen to any uh, any kind of mp3s, download those mp3s and use those for your projects with a perpetual license. Some of those do require attribution to the artist, but most of them don't. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm really happy to share uh, all of my learning and gleaning, whatever wisdom you may have picked up from this. Um, I just wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share it and hopefully uh, we'll be able to see some of your content as you guys create stuff. Thanks. Sorry, I had to be muted at least once so that <laughs> just to make it a typical program. Um, that was a really awesome. And all of those resources that you've just provided are so helpful. Um, again, I always like to say that I am the target audience for these <laughs> webinars uh, as someone who, you know, runs an association with a very small staff and budget, all of these technical, um, all of the technical information that is being provided is so helpful. So we do have um, a couple questions that have come in from attendees over the course of your talk. Um, one of the first ones, it was a little bit earlier in the session, but uh, can you talk a little bit more about using paper prototypes to develop storyboards? Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, if you don't really know what a project needs to be, um, but you have a team of people who are all giving input, they really want to understand, okay, what's, what's this going to look like? How are we going to frame this? Do we need this type of shot to go along with this part in the script, um, that can be a big help just to show this is the footage that I know that I've shot with this drone. And here, let me just sketch it on paper real quick to, to give you a, a feel for what this shot is going to look like. We're currently working on one um, right now that we're hoping to release later this year. It just sort of shows a, a broad range of what we've um, worked on, things, programs that we've run, um, you know, footprint impact that we've had uh, as a museum in our community. And it's, you know, a 90 second script. So I'm shopping through that script and I'm finding, oh, this is a good video clip that I know I have somewhere <laughs> on my computer that I can put in there. And when you have a whole team of people who are working to make that um, cohesive and fluid and just, you know, so it's, it's succinct and it, it really tells a uh, impacting narrative you 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 can use those to to draw it to sketch it to to show people what we're talking about what is what is this really going to look like and if somebody gives you a script that doesn't have any uh real clear pictures then okay well i don't, I don't know what kind of footage are we are we going to use here do we just let somebody talk from showing their face um if it's something that i know that i don't have or i don't have permission to, like if we had our summer camp programs with our kids, if we wanted to highlight that, well, we didn't, if we didn't have summer programs with our kids or we didn't get video of that, we've got to be creative and figure out what we're going to use in its place. And that's where you can just, you know, shoot a close up of a kid's hand, like flipping a page in a book or draw 
a close up, get a close up of somebody, um, you know, doing a drawing or, you know, glue sticking something, a collage. There's, there's ways that you can um, portray what's being said in the content visually, and you can connect those dots. Well, and just, it, it, I'm sure that uh, helps with the collaborative process as well, leading up to the video. And and I guess, do you have a typical timeline um, or what's the amount of time, are we talking weeks, months that you prepare to shoot for one of those videos? If it's a, if it's a larger, more in-depth, and I know, I know the quality needs to be, you know, well-made, then I usually do give it a little bit longer timeline, probably a month minimum for, for me to sort of, you know, chew and um, ruminate on what it needs to be, if I need to go get more footage. Um, and then I, I also wanna build in the review process. So if there's a due date of December 1st, I'm not gonna run into their office, here's the video on, you know, November 30th. <laughs> there needs to be uh, enough back and forth. Okay, well, this is good. We like this, but let's maybe change this around. So it's it's sort of a working relationship. Um, and I think uh, if, if I have a lot of stuff that's on my plate, and that's where it's tricky, again, being the only person on staff who's, who's doing this, um, it can be challenging um, working with multiple projects at the same time. And then, oh, they're all due right here before this major exhibit goes live. So I have to um, manage my time pretty well. Well, and that's why I always ask about the realities of the time that goes into this, just to kind of convey what to expect. Um, here's a question that I'm really curious to see how you answer it. What's the most creative thing you've seen done with a green screen? Um, I don't know. I think uh, that I've that I've seen. Um, that's a really good question. I think I think uh, I, I'm I'm not a huge fan of green screens, even though I, you know, gave some information on them. Um, if you if you have a way for people to sort of see videos behind you, but you want that talking head, you know, just like Streamyard, it allows us to do a picture in picture or mm -hmm. side by side imaging that works and most people nowadays are used to seeing just a side-by-side -side, uh, frame. But um, if you have something that really that allows the, the um, subject to sort of interact with it, if they're, you know, having something move or, you know, throwing stuff out of a drawer and there's like green screen person doing this and you want to put in like an animated character or something, Okay. Uh, I guess that's that's a benefit, but um, I haven't I haven't seen anybody. I haven't been able to watch somebody do that. Uh, I've only, you know, kind of been the the ticket holder <laughs> in the blockbuster <laughs> movies. Where I'm like, how did they do that? And then you go and watch, um, and it is kind of cool. One one thing I really thought was amazing. Oh, what movie was it? Star Trek. There's a scene where they're like skydiving. They jump off this really tall tower, and they're plummeting towards earth um all they did to film that was stood on a mirror and they showed this so they showed pictures of them from the ground pointed up and all this wind in their face but they really just stood on a mirror and blew wind down onto them so that it looked like the sky <laughs> was behind them and i was like that's all they did wow okay T tips and tricks i mean that's exactly exactly why we do these to pull back the curtain um, here's one that comments on lighting glass enclosed objects, like uh, in a vitrine in a museum um, to remove the glare. And then in that same question, ring lights, are they really that useful? So that's a two-parter. Yeah, um, we have vitrines and just like my glasses are, if I can get them reflecting, you, you can't really even yeah, tell where I'm looking. This is just <laughs> uh, white. So it's, it's a... Um, it's a speed bump for sure. Um, one thing that I haven't done this yet because I don't have the drapery and the black and the curtains to hide everything behind, but our, our photography department does. They'll they'll make a black wall 
on the camera side of the vitrine and then they'll shoot it that way so that um there's there's no there's no light from the from the reflection there's no light that's coming through everything is just blacked out um if you have to do that you know that that's an option um i've i've done a couple videos where i'll go and edit it all together and then i notice wait <laughs> that there's me and there's my hand and there's my camera <laughs> and you really have to think about that and if all you have is you know a little tiny lcd screen you can't really tell how how big that's shown up in frame um so it's you know fixing it in post is, is the thing that i usually do but if i if i'm shooting a vitrine and i kind of get get it from the three-quarter angle not not directly head on um then that's usually enough of a light deflection for me to kind of get a moving shot or shoot through the glass as it's a little bit angled so that i can get what's inside the vitrine but not necessarily um everything else my light stands and you know somebody else's foot um the other thing about ring lights um i don't have one i've never used one i've only seen them you know kind of the same way my glasses are reflecting light uh, i can see the ring lights reflected off of other things that are in frame or mm. whoever, um, has a reflective surface uh i think if you're shooting like um on a smaller scale um in a little you know white box um and it needs to look good and maybe like some macro uh photography or videography you really need to zoom in and get some details i guess they're okay but um you know i i just think even even the um there's some lights that uh well this this isn't one of them but uh this is an aperture light and it um has like a thing on the front where you can adjust you can put different gels and colors um oh. to to make your light uh, diffused or whatever. It also is waterproof, so I could submerge this in water if I wanted to. Um, I'll turn it on, but a lot of LEDs now, oh, that's snuck on button. A lot of LEDs now, uh, they have a, a whole row. It's like a square and they have all these different rows of lights. It just doesn't really have a natural look, in my opinion, when you're looking at those lighting a subject because um, it's just sort of all these miniature shadows. Uh, you can tell, like even street lights, the LEDs. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of different little teeny tiny shadows in there. I can notice that. Some people don't notice that, but it, it just doesn't look natural. So the ring light, I kind of feel like it's the same sort of thing where it, it doesn't it doesn't look great. It doesn't look bad, and if that's all you have, I know you can get some pretty inexpensively. Um, so I'm not against them, but I just don't prefer them. Okay, well, there we've actually got a few more questions, but we have run out of time. So I think what I'll do with those questions um, are to repost them in the forum that'll be on the Museum Learning Hub website. And um, we can, you know, I can maybe entice you to help <laughs> answer some of those questions. Um, but you know, thank you so much, Luke, for, for doing this for us. And there's a lot of really great um, information in today's session. So, and now I just wanna sort of close this out with a few final reminders um, for all of those. If you enjoyed this program, then please do us a favor and share it with your network. We do really appreciate participation and hope to see you in the chat for future programs. Um, and again, after each module, all four videos will be available on our website, as well as a complete toolkit of resources provided by our presenters. So definitely stay tuned to the museum-hub.org for more information um, and upcoming events. And finally, I would like to remind everybody to please join us next Thursday, October 21st, for the second technical training workshop for module seven which will focus on video planning and distribution. Uh, this session will be taught by Elena Valentine, who is the CEO and co-founder of Skill Scout in Chicago, and it will cover planning for video production, including the use of production templates, as well as the different platforms used to distribute videos. So I've enjoyed being today's host, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you all for attending today's session. Have a 
terrific day. Bye.